Amen. Good morning, Access Church family. It's great to be reopened and with uh, everybody here this morning. And thank you for joining us online. If you're uh, streaming the service live, it's great to be with you this morning. Um, just something I was thinking about this morning that I wanted to um, have all of us ponder this morning as uh, God in me had me ponder it for those of us here and for those of us online. You know, the Apostle Paul in the first chapter of Philippians uh, wants us to be confident in one thing. And he says that to be confident in this, that God who began a good work in you and I who have decided to, to start this journey and to follow Christ, that he will see it through to completion until the day of Christ, until Christ comes back for us. And, and in that moment when I was thinking of that verse, despite everything going on in our world right now, church, the Holy Spirit asked me, are you confident, Garrett, that I am continuing to do the work in you? Because it says to be confident. And so I... I just want to encourage us this morning, despite what's going on maybe in your own personal life, despite what's going on in this world, I just encourage each and every one of us to ask that question. Am I confident in God that he is continuing to do the work in me that he says he will and that he will complete? And so this morning, I just leave you with that as we continue to worship and go through the service to answer that question and to be confident that God who began the good work in you will see it to completion. And so this morning, I just want to encourage us as we continue to worship and we get ready to give our tithes and offerings. For those of us here this morning, there's two ways. There's uh, the box that you can drop your tithes and offerings in and then also bring your tithes and offerings up here. For those of you online, um, continue to use. We have our online giving available to you. So um, let's just open up with a word of prayer and pray for our offering and for our service. Heavenly Father, we just pause this morning. And we just want to stand in awe of the Creator. And we just want to say, God, we submit. You're created, submit to the creator. God, we take the crown off our own head and we lay it down at your feet. And we just ask, Lord, that you will be king and Lord of our lives. God, that this morning we, that you will examine as we allow our heart to be open every little area of our life. And I pray, dear God, that through this service and through your message, that, that Lord, you will proclaim your truth, that you will speak boldly and courageously your message. And I pray that through that you will examine each and every one of our hearts. And that once the service is done, that Lord, a little bit more of our lives will be consecrated to you. For as the Apostle Paul says, may I decrease and you increase. Lord, that is the cry of our heart this morning. May you increase Christ in us and may we decrease in self. May you be glorified and lifted up during this time as we continue to worship you in spirit and in truth. Thank you, God, for continuing to provide for the needs, not only in our personal lives, but in the needs of this church. I pray, dear God, for those of us that have accessibility to download the prayer app, that we will do that, Lord, to stay connected, to know what's going on in the lives of, of your people, and to add things to our prayer list to pray for. So, Lord, we just give you honor and praise this morning, and I just pray that you will bless this offering. May it be to the glory of your kingdom to provide for the work that you are doing here 
1414 Park Street at Access Church. Now, Lord, inhabit the praises of your people as we continue to glorify you through praise and worship. It's in your name, Lord, we pray. Amen.
God is holding on. It's great to have faces in here. I can't move this around too much. What if I go over here? Just kidding. We're back. Okay. This is just stuff we have fun. You guys are here now with us, so you get to have fun with us. All right. So I'm glad that a few of us are here. I'm not sure if I turned this on. I did. Sorry. So I want you, we're going through Jesus teaching us how to pray. So I'm glad you guys get to be with us in here. And those of you online. And so will you, let's just start off by praying the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Because his disciples said, hey, you often withdraw to be with the Father. Tell me how you pray. And so they wanted to learn how to pray. And so a lot of us know this prayer. If you're raised Catholic like myself, uh, you know this prayer very well. And so um, whatever version you say that in, we do have it on the screen if you're here in the sanctuary. Uh, but wherever you are at, at home, um, let's say this prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The word uh, uh, amen, some of, one of my kids asked me recently, what does that mean? And it really means so be it, may it be according to what you say. It's a, it's a statement of agreement, agreeance, you know, agreement. And so, uh, but I want us to focus in each week. We're fortunate we'll have some of our guys back from Faith Community that will bring in the word as well in a couple weeks. But we're going to break apart this, this prayer and really try to delve into um, how Jesus taught us how to pray. Jesus didn't teach the disciples what to pray for. He taught them how to pray. And so there's a difference between that. He taught us in what manner should we approach the Father. And so the focus I want us to think about this morning is your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it, as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Right? That's the prayer. A lot of the songs this morning had that emphasis and that focus on God's kingdom. So a few years back, and many of you know that uh, I was brought up in the Catholic faith. Uh, I'm very fortunate to have been brought up in that faith. I feel like that that, has, that really gave me a great foundation in, in my relationship with God today. But a few years back, um, I had a few Sundays off. It's unusual. I do get those sometimes. And um, I decided that um, and my husband and family were here uh, at church, doing church. And so I was going to be by myself. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to go to Mass. And some of you are like, what's a Mass? Well, Mass is service, what, you, what, what uh, Protestants call going to church or to service. Um, as Catholics, we call that going to Mass, and Mass is just the order of the service. And so I thought that morning I got up and I thought, you know what? I haven't been to Mass in years, a very long time. I thought, I'm going to go to Mass. And so as I'm driving to, I think I went to St. Luke's. I think it's St. Luke's. It's off of kind of El Dorado, kind of by First Baptist. I think that's St. Luke's. I thought... Catholic Church is saying wherever you go, right? And so, I, so I'm headed to Mass, and I'm reflecting on what it was like to go to Mass growing up versus what going to church is like in the Protestant tradition. And some of you are probably thinking, well, what is Protestant? Protestant would be what you think of as Christian, right? Because we have a tendency to say, I'm a Christian and you're a Catholic. Well, let me just put that misnomer out there. Catholics were Christians before we were Christians. So uh, the word Catholic means universal, one church. And so, but, uh, so if you're, you're either part of the, if you're a Christian, you either follow Catholicism and you go to the Catholic church, or if you're a Protestant, then you go to a, you follow Protestantism and you go to a Protestant church, but both are Christian. So, um, but I was thinking, I was reflecting as I was driving about, man, just thinking about the differences between what I grew up, of going to Mass and all that I remembered about Mass, and then how church is in, we'll, say, we'll use that term for your sake, the Christian church, right? And so, as I'm thinking about it, all of a sudden I realized that in the Catholic church in Mass, the emphasis is on God. 
everything is about this is the order of service and everything is designed to remind us about god the father god the son and god the holy spirit and all the sacraments that take place and the order of service that takes place all of those things are designed around really what god um, magnifying god and then i thought about how in the protestant church we tend to be more concerned and thought about the congregants. What is the congregant? Catholics don't care whether you like it. <laughs> I, so I, I spent 20 years in the Catholic Church. Um, and I got some people here out here who have been in the Catholic Church probably longer than me, I know. And the, I don't know, in fact, my mom is here, I could probably ask her, and who else was Catholic? I know, Monica, you, got, you were in the Catholic Church, a couple different people. Pumpkin, did you go to the Mass? In all the years, and if you're out there and, and you are uh, born and raised Catholic, been going to the Catholic Church, um, I don't recall in my time, and I'm not sure if my mom or Pumpkin or Monica or some others know this, or you out there, have they ever asked you what you want? Yeah. If you're wondering, they're all nodding no. <laughs> there was never a, a church poll. They never asked us congregants if we like the hard pews. Nope, that never came up. No, they didn't ever ask us that. They didn't ask us if we like these songs and these chants that they sing and they say and we don't understand. Nope, never took a poll. Never asked us if we like that. Uh, they never asked us what kind of music. Never asked us that. Uh, they, they never, uh, we didn't have worship leaders. We didn't have a Kayla growing up. Uh, we had an organ. That, that's what we had. Uh, it was a lovely organ. And, uh, and it played music. And um, so that was good. And there was prayers and there was rituals and there was all these things that took place, but it really wasn't about whether the people were comfortable. It really, it was not driven by the congregants. It was driven, really, in the Catholic Church, it's driven by the sacraments, and the sacraments are things that the Catholic Church or the church believes that, that God, through his word, said you have to do, right? Be baptized, take communion, marriage, these sort of things. And so I was sitting there just reflecting on that for some time, just about how, man, in the, the Protestant, the Christian church, as you might call it, the emphasis is so much about what do the people want? Right? We have hand sanitizer. It's not because I'm worried about getting germs. It's because I want to communicate to you all that I care that you don't get germs. Right? We, we've, got, we've separated all the seats, not because I'm worried that anybody's going to get sick, Right? But I don't want you to be worried you're going to get sick. So we've done that. We've followed all of the things because it's what matters to the people. That's what we do. We're very, you know, leading in a, as a church leader in today in a Christian or Protestant church, it's very difficult. Um, it's, it can be a very difficult task because we tend to be driven by what do the people want. Do people like this kind of music? They only like this long of a service. They prefer chairs to pews. And they, they like more of a sanctuary building instead of a business type building. They have all, and the problem is, I know this is going to come as a shock to everybody, but we all don't get along. We all don't have the same opinions. We all don't like the same things, right? I, I remember being over at our other location. Uh, people, would tell, I, people would come up to me during the church while it's happening you know, because I can do something about it. They would come up to me, I'm sitting in the front row, and they would say, Pastor, the music's too loud. Well, let me get right on that. I mean, what, is it, what are you gonna do about that? I, uh, close your ears, I don't know what to tell you at this point. Right? But they would say things like that, just so you know, um, we would really like it if you put more hymns in. Okay, yeah, that's not gonna happen. I, I don't know. I don't know what the worship team's gonna do. I haven't consulted with them. But when you have a church, when you as church leaders, it's very difficult because you want people to be comfortable. We want people to enjoy being at church. Why? Because we have a message that we want to share. So we definitely want people to want to come here. And if that means you need to have comfortable seats and good music, not too loud, not too quiet, you know, just enough hymns, just enough choruses, you know, and just not too many, but not too little, and you know. We're going to do our best to accommodate people because we want as many people to come so that they can hear that message. It's really hard being a church leader because it's an impossible task 
for us to be able to please all people. It is an impossible task. And let me tell you something, that's not just church leaders. I wouldn't want to be a leader in our country, in our city, in our state, to, for, and you couldn't pay me enough money to be a leader in any of those positions. Because guess what? They're always going to do it wrong. Some of you go, oh, no, no, not my guy. Yeah, your guy's going to do it your way. But what about your neighbor who doesn't think that guy's going to do it your way? It's just impossible for us to please all people all the time. I think we can all agree with it. That's a, that's a pretty um, smart statement. I don't think anybody would disagree with that, right? We're living in a time where we seem to, though, be trying to do just that. We're living in a time where we're trying to please all people. We want all people to be comfortable. Right? It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter young or old, it doesn't matter the color of our skin, the gender, it doesn't matter. We want to make sure that all people are, 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 are right, are comfortable, um, and, and it's creating uh, pandemonium, really. I think you would agree with that, right? If you have any sort of social media account, it is like, just it's just, it's just craziness out there. Well, it's, it's because we're not getting along. We're not agreeing. I, we're not agreeing. My daughter said to me sometime back, just a couple of years ago, and she said, why is there so much division in our world? Why do you think, she said, why do you think there's so much division in our world? And I said, it's because we promote it. We promote it. We actually promote division. Now, now hear, me, hear, hear this. We want unity. There's no question that everybody wants unity. I'm not saying what we want, but what we don't realize is that we promote division. We promote division because we are living in this time where we're trying to make it so everyone can be right. Where everyone can be right. What you think, what you believe is right and unfortunately, that only promotes division. If everything that you see is, you know, it's all about you, it's what you want, you need to be comfortable, what, how you feel and how you believe things should be is right. And so are you, and so are you, and so are you, and so are you. Well, there's gonna be a problem because some of those people I just said are all right, disagree that the person next to them is right, correct? Right? Are you with me? Because right? see, here's the deal. What is a right or a belief or something to you might actually possibly be an offense to someone else. Right? And, and that could be the other way around. What somebody else deems as a right or a belief might be offensive to you. It's, it's just we come from all walks of life. We come from all different experiences. We should presume to know, we should not presume to know somebody else's position because I've heard this said before. People will say, well, if I was in their shoes, I would do it different. I said, no, I know exactly how you do it, exactly how they did it because you would be in their shoes. You know, people say, if I was Eve, I wouldn't have eaten from the tree. Yes, you would have. You know how I know? Because you just made yourself Eve. And so I already know what Eve is going to do. If you say that you were going to do so, I would not do that if I was that. If I, if I was that person, I wouldn't make that decision. Yes, you would. Because you're that person. You just made yourself that person. What you're doing is taking your life experiences, you're taking your understandings about things, and then you're taking their crisis or their decision, what they're making, and you're putting it on you and saying, well, this is how I would decide that. Well, of course it's going to be different. You just took their one decision that they have to make and attached it to your life. You can't, that's not fair. That's not fair. Right? But we live in a culture that says everyone's right. And so we're promoting this division instead of this unity. This unity. Heavenly Father, may your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I really want you to think about that. I really want you to think about that phrase. Your kingdom come. I think 
if I asked Christians everywhere, they'd say, "I man, we need God's kingdom come. I've heard people say this before. Uh, you know, they would want Jesus to be the president. No, you don't. And so uh, you think you do. Uh, but he's going to say some things that are going to upset newsflash Republicans and liberals, just so you know. Right? Because we think that, Lord, may your kingdom come. May it be as you say. Right? May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But the reality is we need to because unity is not about agreeing. <coughs> unity is not about we're not all going to come from the same walks of life. We're not all going to experience the same thing. But we can be unified in our one purpose, in our one belief. May God's kingdom truly reign. It's interesting because that's one of the things about the Catholic Church that probably they never got into what does the people want. Because you're going to have pandemonium. Because <laughs> not all the people are going to agree. Right? So they, they have a structure that says, here's the church, and this is how we're going to do it. And if you don't like it, you, you don't have to be a part of it. Right? And so the word Catholic literally means universal. That's what it means. That's what that word means, because there was one church, one Father, one God, one baptism, one Holy Spirit. And so there was this one church. They believed that the first pope in this universal one church was actually St. Peter, the Peter that we read about in the Bible. And so this idea that of this of this kingdom come, your will be done, this is why this would be considered, that's why I say if you're Catholic, you know this prayer. Why? Because we read it from the time I was born, this prayer was probably read over me. I didn't know what it meant until I had this relationship I'm going to talk about that. We talk about this difference between this your kingdom come, your will be done, and how it begins with Father. In this relationship. But now more than ever in our world today, especially, we need this prayer to be answered. We need God's kingdom to come, right? Somebody say amen to that. We do. Because it's not going to, let me just put, give you a newsflash. Everybody that's watching and listening, it's not going to go your way. And I'm not talking to one of you. I'm not talking to half of you. I'm not talking to three of you. I'm not talking to ten of you. I'm talking to all of you. It's not going to go your way. Embrace it. Because you actually might be wrong about something. I know that was a new swash for some people this morning. But you are actually not right about everything. You're just not. Because guess what? The reason why we want God's kingdom to come, because God as king is an all-knowing king. We don't have anybody in our authority that's all-knowing. We don't. God is all-knowing. So when we say we want his will to come, we want... God's will to come. Garrett referenced that Philippians 1 6 that he who began a good work in us, in his people here on earth, he began this work. He's going to finish it. And this work, the work that he's doing is restoring his creation back to him. That's what he's doing. That's the work he's doing in the world right now. Don't make it anything more than that. And so, Lord, would your kingdom come and would your will be done? I can't think of anything better than to have mankind be restored back to its creator to eliminate all think about it your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it would be in heaven think about what it's like in heaven <laughs> some of you are going well i know what's happening in heaven i'd be right no you wouldn't <laughs> but you wouldn't care because there's only one who's right and it's god there's only one who's good and it's god and so in heaven there's no disagreement there's no disobedience to each other there's no hostility between man, and there's no hostility between us and the Creator. There is this oneness that exists, and everybody just falls in line with that because they want to, they love to. It's just part of the oneness that God created us with, and we want that here on earth. That's what we're actually praying is, Lord, may your kingdom come and your will be done. Shortly after Jesus teaches that prayer, in the first time he teaches it, not when he's teaching his disciples, but in that first sermon when he teaches the, the Lord's Prayer that we just quoted, he actually says in that same sermon later, he goes on to say, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. That's not, that's not a popular verse, right? But God's kingdom coming and his will being done are directly connected. 
These are not two separate events. It's not, Lord, we want your kingdom to come, and then also we want your will to be done. The, the God's kingdom coming is his will being done. Are you with me? They're, they're together. It's one thing. The kingdom of God is the realm in which God's will is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is the realm in which God's will is fulfilled. When I was uh, in my first church in Vacaville, it was actually called Vacaville First Church. There was a guy in the church, it's so funny. He said he wanted to sit in the secretary's office and answer the phone. Uh, Second Church of the Nazarene, this is so beautiful. But when I was in my first church, and it was First Church of the Nazarene, and it was in Vacaville, and um, we we knew that we had a new pastor that was uh, that we were trying to elect. Our other pastor felt God was calling him on. We're just going to Oregon. And my family and myself was a very big part of the church. We had a thriving children's ministry. It was great. We loved it. We loved the children. We loved all the ministry work we did there. It was hard to see ourselves outside of that church. And so, but the church loved us. And they really felt strongly that I should be able to stay as a children's pastor. But when you elect a new pastor to come in, oftentimes the old uh, staff have to resign so that the new pastor can come in and establish their own leadership and who they want to hire. And so it's just, it's just a practice that we do, that we just have all the staff resign. They can stay to help. If the new pastor wants to rehire them, they can. And that was just, that's just the policy in the church, and it works. And so they knew that, that as new pastors would come to interview, the congregation would ask the pastor that's interviewing, well, what are you going to do with Pastor Renee? We want you to keep Pastor Renee. It was almost like, we'll let you come, but you got to keep her. So it became very contentious, because yes, believe it or not, shocking thing, not everybody gets along in the church, and uh, not everybody agrees in the church. This is why we have to separate them. It's, it's pandemonium here. Don't, uh, pandemonium here. Don't even get here, man. I, I don't even want to tell you what's going on behind that phone. It's, there's some girls that are going crazy over there. Anyway, so, bet you want to come next week. So, right? So, in the church, they didn't like that. And so they were so worried that the pastor would not keep me. And so they had to, the district superintendent that came down had to call an all church meeting to talk to the church. And, uh, and so I asked the district superintendent at the time, and I said, would it be all right if I addressed the congregation? And he said, yes. He knew what I was going to say, so he wasn't going to let me go rogue. And so I stood up and I asked the congregation, I know how much you love me, and I know how much you absolutely believe that I need to stay here. <laughs> but I want to ask you something. Do you want what God wants, or do you want what you want? <coughs> And I didn't want to leave. I didn't want to leave that church. That was hard to leave that church. It's still hard to think about not being a part of that church. It was a great church. But sometimes, God's will is not our will. Sometimes we have to do what God is leading us to do. And that doesn't always match up to what we want to do. So I asked the congregation, do you want what you want for me? Or do you want what God wants for me? And those are two different things. And it really changed. And there was this release of, oh my gosh, we were trying to keep you because that's what we wanted. It's not necessarily, we didn't even really ask God what he wanted. We just assumed it would be God's will that you would. How many times have you assumed, well, obviously that's God's will, duh. Well, I'm going to tell him more. Right? Because you don't see the bigger picture. You don't see what God is doing. Because God doesn't see a bigger picture. Let me help you out here. God sees the whole picture. He sees everything. He sees everything. The, team, the kingdom of God is a realm in which God's will is fulfilled. God's will is fulfilled. And we are praying that God's kingdom would reign. Reign on earth just as it does in heaven. So I want you to think about kingdom. A kingdom is a territory. It's a group of people, a nation, ruled by a king, right? And what does it mean to pray in this manner? What does it mean to have this attitude of seeking God's kingdom and will to be done? How do we do this? We can pray it because it's not simply saying words. I grew up saying the words to the Lord's Prayer. I didn't realize what those were until I was an adult. Right? So how do we do this? not saying words. It's not putting them on signs. But here's what it is. It is living as subjects to the king. 
If you want his kingdom to come on earth, where you are, in your world, then we become subjects to the king. We become residents of the kingdom. We become subjects to the kingdom's view, to what is this kingdom about. We're going to line ourselves up with that. If we desire to truly have his kingdom here on earth, then we must submit to our heavenly king. You know, we hate that word. Some of you, your back just went up when I said submit. You're just like, I just got uncomfortable. I'm going to get a donut, right? I mean, it's, <laughs> man, that's just like, what's up with you, right? That starts when you're two years old. Don't believe me. I'll bring Brooklyn and Amelia and Charlotte in here. They'll rock your world. You think they're cute. You spend 20 minutes with them. You throw submission at them. You'll see how well that goes. Right? That just don't tell me what to do. Because it's just, that's part of sin. That's what made Adam and Eve eat from the tree. The tree gave them, guess what? This is a tree. If you get to do it your own way, you're going to love it. And tell the people around you, don't do it your way. Right? Ask Abel how that went. Right? Abel did it his way. Cain did it his way. Guess what happened? One killed the other. Right? Because he didn't get along. Make me look bad. Okay, conflict. Conflict. This, this idea that we have to submit. We just don't like this. But if we want it, we ha- it begins with that submission. We often may wish for God's kingdom to reign in our world today. But we have to understand that before he can reign in the world, he must reign in our life. See, I think we spend so much time trying to get everybody else to obey. I remember somebody telling me a story this week. It's kind of a heartbreaking story, really, simply because it had to do with an animal. And here's this guy that literally just stole a bike. You know, that's against the law, in case anybody's wondering. So that's called not obeying man's law. He's taking a bike, and yet he's got a dog with him who's not obeying him, and so he becomes abusive towards the dog, and I believe he kicks the dog. And the person confronts him and says, why are you doing that? You know, basically this person goes up to him and confronts him. And his response is, my dog's not obeying. (laughs) Wonder what that's like. Are you kidding? (laughs) You just stole a bike. If we think everybody else should obey, right, well, they're not obeying. They're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. We want, we want God's kingdom. We want everybody else around us to obey, right? We want everybody else to obey. We want to pray that God would change others. I've made that mistake, man. I pray that for long. Lord, change this person. Lord, change this person. Lord, change this person. And then I let God get a word in edgewise in our prayers. And then he says, why do you want to change you? And then it's like, I don't want to pray anymore. So I think I'll do something else. Right? He must reign in our life. I want you to think about a question right now. Has God's kingdom come into your life? Does he reign in every part of your life? In every part of your life, does God reign? Not generally. Generally, it's always great, but very specifically in how you think, and how you act, how you treat others, is God reign there? Does he have total authority? To have this spirit or attitude of wanting God's kingdom to come and his will to be done, we must embrace an attitude of submission. We must embrace that. I know it's difficult. And I mean submitting to his will, not the will you believe that he should have. Our Father in heaven. So I want you to think about this. Jesus said, this is how you're going to pray. First, go to him as Father. Now you need to know something that was very unusual for them. Because Jesus was talking to Jewish people. And Jewish people would have never referred to God as Abba. That's the Greek word for, it's actually for Daddy. It's not even really thought. It's actually daddy, which is a term of endearment. Most of the time you hear young children call their parent mommy and daddy. Because the younger they they are, the greater the dependent they are on their father or their mother. So mommy or daddy. And Jesus is saying, first, you need to approach this heavenly sovereign God king as dad. 
And imagine what the Jews were sitting there thinking, I am not going to call. It's kind of like us Catholics, right? It's like, I'm not saying that. I'm going to be struck down. I remember being in the church for about a year and a half um, after uh, being part of the Nazarene church. And I remember watching people, and I thought, well, you guys aren't afraid of God. Us Catholics, we're afraid of them. You know, you guys are very, very casual with this whole God thing. If you were raised in the Catholic Church, you know what I'm talking about. But Jesus said, come to him as Father. We start the prayer with our Father in heaven. Our Father in heaven, right? God is not a ruthless king. Come to him as Father. He's not a ruthless king. Notice that... that Jesus didn't say, um, call him God. Uh, he didn't say he didn't call him Lord. But this term of endearment, Father, God is not a ruthless king. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote my husband here, and I usually have to pay him $20 when I quote him, and this is the $20 I'm going to be happy to pay. But uh, so one time, uh, uh, Lisa and Curtis are living with us, and um, I don't really know how, like, I'm going to tend to tune out a lot that goes on in my house. But uh, something was going on. And so I think Alyssa said, you're like a dictator. And then he said, yes, I am. And he said, this is my kingdom. This is my house. I rule here. It all belongs to me. It's very flattering. Anyway, and then he said, I am a dictator. He goes, but I want you to know I'm a benevolent dictator. That's what he said. So I let that sit for a minute. Some of you are going, I didn't know there was such a thing. Because that's what I thought. I didn't know there was a benevolent dictator. I'm like Hitler. I'm just good. Right? I don't think that's possible. That's like saying, I'm a good demon. But how, how could you be a good demon? Well, I'm not as bad as the other demons. Because really, I don't think any such thing as a benevolent dictator. Benevolent just means generally good. So it's like, I'm the character. So I'm this benevolent dictator. I have good news for you. Although Mark may be a benevolent dictator, God is not a benevolent dictator. He's not. He's a heavenly father who loves us and who has given us rights to the kingdom. It doesn't just belong to him. It belongs to the subject. It belongs to his family. Just as children, we are his children. We are heirs in his kingdom. Everything that is God is yours. If you're a child of God, if you've entrusted your life to Christ, you have become an heir to that kingdom. Think about that for a minute. You become an heir to that kingdom. And so God, Jesus is saying, approach him as father, not this ruthless dictator, not this ruthless king who just wants to lord it over you. In fact, he even told the disciples, the disciples, when they were getting pretty full of themselves, and look at what we can do. We're healing and casting out demons, and man, you should see it, Jesus. There's this one verse where they're like, those people just submit to me. It is awesome. And Jesus goes, whoa. That's not how it's supposed to be. That's not how it's supposed to be. You don't rule it over them like that. Jesus said, the Son of Man, you know, Jesus, God, came to be served not to serve, right? I'm sorry. I said that backwards. <laughs> You're like, really? Sounds more <laughs> Mark's over there going, see, I knew it was right. <laughs> it's not right. It's not right. He came to serve, not to be served. And he said, you need to model that. That isn't how this is. This is my heavenly father who loves you and gave himself for you. Look up Luke 15. You're going to see the picture of this father that waits for his son who's out wandering. A shepherd that goes after its sheep. There's this love that he has. And so Jesus is saying that, that uh, to approach God, to seek him as this heavenly father, because he wants us to seek his kingdom, and he wants his will to come into your life today. I'm going to pray for us here in a minute, have the, the team join us back up here. And I pray that as you're thinking about the things that we're saying this morning, I want you to be able to really reflect on that question. First of all, I think some of us, even out there in, online, if you're watching or if you're in here today, maybe you have not even entrusted your life yet to Christ. Maybe you have not become part of God's kingdom, his family, to be part of God's family, to be heirs to the kingdom. What a powerful thing. When you think of a kingdom, you think of a monarchy, right? 
You think of maybe um, England, you know, the United Kingdom. You think of Queen Elizabeth. Well, the kingdom, the people who are kings and queens, it's by it's by blood, heredity, right? How do we say that word? And so um, they become the son or the daughter becomes the king or the queen. So it's passed on through the family line. So really, the only people who are royal are the people who are part of the king's family. But I want you to think about something. If you are part of God's family, guess what? You're royalty. You're heirs to the kingdom. So Jesus really flips this around for them when he says, when I approach the Father, you can approach the Father the same way I do. Because we're all part of, of, of the kingdom of heaven if you've entrusted your life to Christ. It's a beautiful thing to pray that prayer. So I encourage you, I hope you're praying the Lord's Prayer. I know I put it in the bulletin that I sent out to many of you. This way to pray God's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed, sacred, set apart is your name above all other names. This is the only name under heaven with which we can be saved, Jesus Christ, right? And so sacred is your name. Your name is all-knowing, all-powerful God. And, and, and your will be done, right? Your kingdom, may it come into our life. And so I want you to reflect as, as the team is singing. I want you to reflect on that part. Number one, are you coming to him as father? Or do you see him as this benevolent dictator? That's a wrong view. He's not a ruthless king that wants to lord it over you. He wants you. He wants you to know that he loves you and he cares about you and he sees all and knows all. And so his will can be, don't, don't worry if it doesn't seem like, well, that doesn't seem like that would be God's will because I'm hurting. I was hurting to leave Vacaville. I didn't want to leave Vacaville, but it was God's will that I leave Vacaville. And it was hard for people to see that, but now I see it. There's so many things that I see that God is doing because God sees all. God knows all. He is this heavenly Father. We pray, Father, that your kingdom would come and that your will would be done in my life, in my attitude, in my relationships, how I spend my time, how I spend my talent, how I spend my money. God, I want you to reign in every part of my life. May that happen first. Worry about the world later. Is he reigning in your life? Is he reigning in your life, in your attitude, in your behaviors, and those things? Then, Lord, may your kingdom come. May your will be done. Imagine if all of God's people who claim to be Christian, who have trusted their life to Christ, truly allowed God to reign in their life. You'd actually, can I tell you something? You'd actually see this prayer get answered. You'd actually see God's kingdom start to be visible. It's here, whether we can see it or not. But the more of us that live by it, you'll start to see it. And it'll be amazing. It'll be amazing. And it's got to begin in each one of us. That's my prayer for you this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, I truly pray, as Jesus, you taught us to pray, to approach God as our Father, our Dad. We are so dependent on you, Father God, for the very air that we breathe, the thoughts that we think, the behaviors that we live out, the places we go, the people we interact with. Father, we need your help. Just as a young child needs help from their dad or their mom, Lord, we need you. We know that, Lord, you are sacred. You are nothing like our earthly father. You are nothing like the authorities in our life. You, God, are above all. You are an all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-present God. We acknowledge that. We acknowledge that we come to you and we say, Lord, we want your kingdom to truly reign in our life, to just as it would if we were in heaven. However I would be in heaven, I pray I would be that here, Lord, in every way possible. Lord, I know you're speaking to each one of us individually, not just as a group. And I pray for those of us that maybe you've been saying something and they're hearing it. And I just pray for obedience, Lord. I pray that they would submit to your will. Lord, forgive us that we've looked at submission as such a negative thing, when really it's an absolutely beautiful thing. When we can lift up our arms towards you, Father, and say, may your will be done. Lord, we thank you that you are faithful, 
that you are ever present all the time, that you never give up on us. You are that Father that continues to watch out for us. And now, Father God, may your kingdom come and your will be done.